In most countries, there is a substantial gender pay gap, and that holds true here in the United States. While women here and in many other nations have made great strides in the workplace, inequality persists. I met up with Mercedes to discuss global gender inequality, how she has personally dealt with bias, and the ways that she hopes to empower all women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Vice President, thanks so much for meeting with us. Uh, and it seems uh, so interesting having a, a nice breakfast in an opulent uh, restaurant like this. Talk to me about your experience working in Mexico. Let me, let me ask you this. I've, I've, I've talked to people who've written about poverty and really spent a lot of time immersed in it. And they say you go in with one attitude, you come out with another. How you view poverty changes. How did it change you? Well. It's something that moved my heart all of my life. So I've been involved in activities when I was very young, cooperating with poor people from my church, for example, and working hard on that, you know? So I think we have to have a focus to bring up our people because the only way we can have happiness as a community is when our people are having better lives. So in my country, for example, we have reduced poverty in a quite important manner more than 20 points of reduction in poverty in a very short time uh, period of time uh, because our growth permit us to create new jobs but also to have a good safety net for the people so we can avoid intergenerational poverty repetition you know with some programs and when you see that you can see people coming into the middle class having new opportunities bring them better education, better health the services, water and sewage, all the basic needs are covered, then you can, you have to bring them better things at the same time. So reforms for bringing people up are continuous. You cannot stop, you know. So when you worked in Mexico, uh, were there things that you learned uh, with, as you talked about Peru, lifting up people out of poverty, were there things you learned there that you could use in Mexico? I mean, is it transferable? Because we've seen in China, you know, uh, and people say it's so remarkable what's happened there. It's remarkable what's happened in Peru. But are there transferable ideals? Oh, yes, for sure. For example, the program Progresa, I think that's the name in Mexico, it's the same program that we have in Peru called Juntos, which is a program of uh, having some subsidies, but conditional subsidies. In, it's a case in which you put conditional subsidies to these people, in, in the conditions are very simple. I bring you some money, you mother, you will have some money for your children, but you make sure these children have gone to the school, they have the vaccinations, and you are aware of other policies. So you go to this conference with your family. In our country, we added something else, is bring them to a productive activity, for example. We have it mostly in rural areas. We are just starting with the urban areas when we see poverty. In Mexico, it's more advanced. They have urban and rural areas, we learn from the mistakes also. So we are learning what they are doing and what we did wrong and they did wrong so we can avoid these mistakes, you know. So these conversations among our countries are there and we can work together, you know. A woman in politics, it's never easy in any country. Uh, talk to us about the difficulties of that and, and you as a role model for women in your, in your country. Yes, it's hard, you know, because I say to myself, I'm a role model, you know, when some, <laughs> the other day I was having dinner with some friends and the two young girls came to me and said, we're in a local restaurant, not, not in a fancy restaurant, and two girls came to me and said, you're a role model for us, I mean, this is a high responsibility, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because these two young girls were talking about their own lives to me, you know, they say, my mother is a, ma a woman that is working very hard because my father, was killed during the time of Shining Path. And I was like, this is a great story about talking that I'm not the role model. Her mother, their mother was the role model. Her mother was working, working women, you know. And, and I said, yes, you have to keep on your dreams. You have to work and don't feel that you are less than a man. You have to feel that you're right. And if somebody is doing something that sounds bad to you, for you, 
discriminating you you have to talk about that and that's why I'm doing that's why I came here to Washington I'm working in a conference on uh, women leadership and political leadership and telling them don't feel uh, uh, less but at the same time I have to fight in the Congress and I said okay we have to establish some quotas we are here in the Congress because we have this 30 percent qu quota and it helps women voice being there you know it's hard to to say because I'm very liberal and I don't like quotas that much but at the same time I see sometimes you have this to have this temporal uh, positive discrimination for being there and then moving ahead and being this making this a norm afterwards it, it, it's not easy though I'm no. sure uh, your career you've had to you know knock heads with some men along the way how mm -hmm. tough has it been and, and what inspires you to keep going well I have a daughter <laughs> <laughs> so my daughter is my inspiration I think when I see her living her own lives and her life is now she's an advocate for a very feminist woman uh, and, and it's because I think I have to, to, to put my efforts so all will do it afterwards. They have the opportunity. I've been a, I'm a mother and I also have been a teacher. And when I see my students at the university being ladies are doing their job, being very good in their lives, it's, I feel I put something there, you know. It's, it's fantastic to see that. How tough has it been, though? It was tough. I have a pro I had faced these problems through all my own lives. My first job, I have a, a gentleman saying, "Oh, what are you doing here? You probably have something with your boss." And I said, "What?" <laughs> I, I couldn't believe listen to that. You know, I'm here as work, working as a consultant at that time, a young consultant because I'm good. I'm, I know my job. I'm I'm this. Talk, talking those issues, my this, my paperwork at, at school, my dissertation was on on industry at that time. So why I have to be discriminated because of that? And having that through life, yes, I did have that problem through life. I have to face it and make sure that I was there because of my own rights. <laughs> Does the fight get easier, or is it just the same? You just have to keep plugging away. I have to keep working on that. I was the first minister of finance, for example in my country, women Minister of Finance. And I have to face the journalists were making jokes about saying I was light. And I say, why? I have been minister before, you know, I was minister of trade, I was minister of production. Why being minister of finance should be a job only for men? And I say, I'm an economist. What is, what is the problem, you know? They were making cartoons about me, like all that. Then when I was tough, like respected tough, toughness that Minister of Finance should have, they say, oh, no, 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 she's a Thatcher. Talking about Mrs. Thatcher, who has this right. representation right. of a tough woman. And I said, I'm not a Thatcher, I'm not a light woman. I'm, I'm a woman, basically, like any other. And as an economist, I know that I have few resources, and assigning resources is very hard, you know? <laughs> basically that. So I had to make the distribution in the right way. <laughs> so you can only end up in two columns, Margaret Thatcher or your light, one exactly. or the other. One or the other. Yeah, that's not, that seems patently unfair, but yeah. uh, you've found your way. Since 2016, Mercedes has served as vice president of the Republic of Peru and as a member of Congress. She previously served as prime minister and was also appointed minister of foreign trade and tourism where she signed trade agreements with leading global economies, including China, South Korea, and the European Union. She was the first woman in Peruvian history to serve as Minister of Economy and Finance. She also served as country representative for the Inter-American Development Bank in Mexico City. She's also been a consultant with a variety of international organizations, including the World Bank, the United Nations, and the Development Bank of Latin America. Mercedes received her master's degree in economics from the University of Miami, where she was also a PhD candidate. One of the things that I read recently, I want to get your thoughts on this, especially from the fact that you're an economist. Uh, I read recently a statement, every billionaire is a policy failure. Uh, and, and this gets to the whole income inequality. It's here in the United States, it's in Peru, it's everywhere 
around the world. How do you address that? At the beginning, when you are growing, and growth brings some capitalists to be very rich, but at the same time, you have to keep moving in the direction of bringing up the other ones that are be below. So that's why the government is there. You have to tax people so you can have better income distribution. That's basically that. So taxation is an important tool for that. And that's why taxes are, I believe that taxes are better when they are uh, progressive sometimes, not to tax much the same way the poor and the rich. You have to have extra, extra taxes, not to the business, but to the income generated through the business. You know, and, and of course, fight illusion, fight evasion of taxes. So you have to work on that. Taxing is the only way to have the right distribution of income. Taxing isn't sexy, but I'm glad you went there because in Davos, a, a Dutch historian got a lot of attention. He, uh, he really attacked the ultra rich. He said uh, they are in the business of tax avoidance mm -hmm. and the fact they don't contribute fairly, even as they set out on lofty philanthropic goals, uh, are driving inequality. Um, he's basically uh, preaching to a group that doesn't want to hear that. A lot of wealthy people at Davos, but do you agree with this contention? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, we're working with that. Uh, for example, Peru has signed uh, recently many agreements, given that we are in the OECD uh, program to uh, being invited to, OEC, to be an OECD member. We are working with tax, uh, cross-country cross tax information because we see that some are, are working with tax avoidance and we want to have policy to avoid that, to reduce that. We recently passed some laws to reduce tax avoidance too. And we want to make sure people pay the right taxes because we need to have policy. You know, if people are avoiding taxes, and I would say informality is another way to, of tax avoidance or, or going outside the taxing system. We want people to pay their taxes even from the very first time they're in the industries or working in, in any way. So if we pay our taxes, we can see progress in our people and progress for ourselves, better services. Of course, when you see a government that is also not using the money in the right way, people have the, all the incentive not, not to pay the taxes. So it's a responsibility also for governments to show that the money that the people are paying as taxes are seen in, in, in the right way, in the right resources, in the right services for, for the country. Uh, how about that, turning the page on the allegations of corruption, which we've seen in, in Latin America? Uh, how difficult is that uh, to get the public trust back when there's been accusations like that? And it's happened in Peru, it's happened in Brazil, it's happened throughout the region. Yeah, it, it's very tough. People are not trusting anymore on politicians, are not trusting anymore in their government. So we have to work very hard to show that we are fighting that, that are, we are fighting uh, cartels were like construction cartels we are fighting on that and showing that we're paying less and doing the right uh, policy to avoid that our contracts the government contracts are transparent you can see where you put the money and that there is also the right control on the use of our resources so our contracts and uh, on Every time the, the government is spending should be all transparent uh, because otherwise we will see uh, corruption over there. So all corruption should be fight also in political campaigns. Corruption should be fight everywhere on all the areas and we are. And the president, Vizcarra, uh, our president, has made, named our, this year the name of this make, the strengthening of the corruption fight because we really want to reduce these uh, events in our lives and see a country that is using their monies in the right way. Recently, Peru's Congress unanimously passed the Equal Pay Law. It requires employers across the country to evaluate and categorize jobs in an attempt to close the gender gap and protect women against wage discrimination. We'll, we'll talk about uh, competitiveness with salaries because, you know, we've talked about women and, and their role. Uh, we see in so many countries where a, a woman can work just as hard, if not harder, than a man and get paid much less. Yes. How do you, how do you bring about that kind of parity? 
that was part of our plan. We have to equate the salaries. And what I did, I present a law in which not only I ha the, we said women should have the same salaries from the same job and the same abilities, but also to have sure, make sure that this is implemented. So I presented a law in which the firms should present uh, their policies of no discrimination and present their, uh, I would say, the, 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 the policies on salaries in such a way that we can see if their women are really pay accordingly to their, to their abilities and, of course, of the job they are, are, are represented. So that was the first part. Of course, it will take time uh, to make sure that that will be totally fill, fill up because there is a lot of informality in the market, there is a lot of unfairness yet, but at least we are moving in the right direction, I think. It harkens back to your conversation earlier about uh, the, the young women coming up and saying, you're a role model, and you're, you're saying, no, your mom's a role model, because there are single moms out there bringing up their kids and on, on less money, uh, which it gets back to the whole poverty issue. I mean, how do you pull them up if you don't take these steps, right? Yeah, the thing is that we have to make sure that women, that particular women in poverty that are more vulnerable, should have not only the opportunity, they, they need the help. Before we used to have our mothers that were helping because they weren't working in the formal area, but they're working at home. But now this safety net, I would say, is not there anymore. So m mothers are working too. My mother used to work, myself, is, I'm working, my daughter is working, so everybody works at, in the family. So how we do that? In, well, we have some programs. For example, we have uh, um, the possibility to have a program called Kunamas for women in poverty. That means that we can have their children being at this place. I can't remember the name in English. It's a like a nursery school? Nursery school. Yeah. So you can bring the children there. The women can go and work. Or some of them can work with the nursery school and be, have, have some income. And of course, that way they can realize their lives in a better way. Also, we can have policies that can equate the possibilities of maternity and paternity leave. So men and women can cooperate in the family. Not only women should be in charge of the family, also the men should be involved. And other policies that can uh, help the recognize, for example, all the protection that we have for elderly or the protection that we have for young kids all together so women can be have some some support to be at, at, the, at the job market you know in in preschool uh, early education uh, a lot of people don't think about that in the in that piece of poverty uh, you're given a job very low wages who's going to take care of your kids you don't have the money to pay for that mm -hmm. so if you don't have programs like that uh, which attacks something entirely different than you coming out of poverty and your salary. If you don't attack this other issue, uh, again, you're stuck, right? Exactly. That's why you, we need particular. I mean, the development of, per, of a person starts from zero to 36 months. That's a very critical time in life in which all this, uh, the brain connections are developed, the main brain connections. And there you have to have not only the support of somebody there taking care of you, but also the, the right uh, food, the, uh, the, the better health you can have, education, and stimulation, and love, which is very important. So the caring people should be also prepared to be there. So we need to have programs particularly for that time of life so we can have later in life more productive people, ha more happier people, because that's the time, a crucial time in life. The lack of women employed in the technology sector is impossible to ignore. However, one program in Peru hopes to change that. Let me ask you about technology. I will talk about a program called Laboratoria in Peru. It's a program uh, run by two ladies. It's a social entrepreneur in which, uh, social entrepreneurship in which they teach young girls that usually are in under the poverty line to create code. And we, that's a problem, you know, in this industry of the high technology, usually women are not there. These ladies learned and said, okay, we will help women to get into this. And the women, they were usually 
without a job, not, not having uh, an opportunity of, of being, uh, starting a r normal career, very poor, they are brought into, brought into this program. Now they are coders and they are producing and they're moving and some of them are hired by Google or Facebook and things like that. Wow. And they are in Peru and now they are in Argentina, in Mexico. It's a program focused on women in poverty that can be coders. This is a nice way to do things. So technology helping with poverty. Exactly. And they, of course, increase their income three times. For, probably you will be working as a clerk in, in the supermarket, earning the local uh, <clears throat> uh, payment that will be like the minimum payment. But with this, they probably will have three times the minimum payment. Fantastic. That changed their lives and their family lives, for sure. But of course, to help them, we have to help them with transportation. Transportation is so hard. To go to the school for them is two hours of traffic. We have to change that. So public transportation is important. Correcting the problems of traffic that we were talking before is good because we can help them to be more safe and have the opportunity to study that.